The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, your peace will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking what is provided, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not go about from house to house. When you enter a town and the people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say the kingdom of, of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and the people do not welcome you, go out into the streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe off in pro protest against you. But know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me. And whoever rejects you rejects me and rejects the one who sent me. The 70 returned with great joy saying, Lord, in your name, even the demons submitted to us. Jesus said to them, I saw Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on scorpions and snakes and over the power of the evil one and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. On Sunday, I listened as Bishop Chris brought us greetings from all the congregations of the Southeast Michigan Synod, his staff. He thanked everyone for everything, including me, and I had two thoughts. First, Bishop Chris is a much more sensitive soul than me. <laughs> and secondly, if a clown was coming at me with a bloody cleaver, I'd do the same thing. <laughs> To all Don's, my brother Don's thanks, I thank you for coming and for being colleagues. Because I don't know if you've noticed, but it's not always easy to be colleagues. Perhaps you've noticed that in the church, we use the word colleague to mask other realities. In my second call, we pastors all smiled and called each other colleague, all the while knowing that we had more ELCA congregations than our community could support. And some of us weren't going to survive. Competitor would have been a more apropos word. In the seminary, we used the word colleague <laughs> to feign egalitarianism in a system built on rank and tenure, where faculty had more status than staff and students had the most at stake, but we were all colleagues. And sometimes we get to use the word colleague as our very own license to kill. <laughs> We offer one another scathing criticism that we would never utter against a friend or a family member or a stranger on the street. But as your colleague, I just have to say, and 
the damage is done. And we hide behind the word colleague so that we don't have to talk about the way personal histories and brokenness, insecurities and power struggles disrupt, decelerate, and derail our participation in Christ's own mission. Because it is Christ's own mission. Have you noticed the way we, we, we in the church forget that? We talk about our mission. My favorite is, we know that God has a mission for us if we just figure it out what it is. As if finding our mission is a Scooby-Doo mystery to be solved. <laughs> I think it's pretty clear Jesus is about bringing abundant life and raising the dead. It's Christ's own mission. The kingdom of God is not something the church does. The kingdom of God is certainly not something the church possesses. The kingdom of God is God's activity. Marcus Borg says that the kingdom of God is God's passion, God's will, God's promise, God's intention for the world at its best, God's utopia, where God's abundance and forgiveness and healing and new life come near. It's called a kingdom because the kingdom of God is different than all the kingdoms of the earth. It transforms all systemic systems. This is good news for the powerless and the oppressed. Not so good news for the powerful and the wealthy. And it's scary because the kingdom of God is coming near. This can only be Christ's mission. It can't be mine. It can't be yours. It can't be ours because we can't pull it off. I've said time and time and again, I'm not sure I'm ready to be crucified. And even when I am, I haven't figured out resurrection for myself. It's Christ's own mission. It's not ours. And so Jesus appoints 70 others and sends them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. We don't know much about the 70, do we? except that there were 70 of them. This number is meant to conjure for us images of the elders of Israel, the 70 that Moses took up the mountain to see God, and the 70 that, that received God's own spirit when caring for the people of Israel was too burdensome, too urgent for Moses. And so Jesus appoints 70 who have seen him, because the mission is urgent. In Jesus' own words, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And Jesus sends us because we have seen Jesus and we know the urgency of the gospel. And Jesus doesn't send us empty handed. Well, yeah, I guess Jesus does. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Take no purse, no bag, no sandals. Greet no one on the road. Jesus sends us powerless by worldly standards so that we need to depend on the treatment of others. Jesus sends us like the one who sends us. 
born in a manger, dependent, dying on a cross, treated by others, by us. Jesus sends us powerless and dependent, just like him. And when we are treated graciously by others, we can point pretty quickly and easily to the nearness of the reign of God, can't we? Yes, Jesus sends us empty-handed, but Jesus does not send us empty. He gives us authority to cast out demons and to cure diseases. And Jesus gives us the privilege of proclaiming that the kingdom of God has come near. In biblical language, casting out demons and curing diseases are God-given signs that verify our proclamation of the nearness of the kingdom of God. Whenever we point to participate in and announce even moments when evil, brokenness, hate, injustice, and death lose. And forgiveness, love, healing, reconciliation, and new life win. <coughs> We proclaim the nearness of the reign of God. For the most important thing that Jesus gives us is this promise. That when we proclaim the reign of God, the nearness of the reign of God, people will have an authentic encounter with Jesus. Whoever listens to you listens to me. And, of course, whoever rejects you rejects me, and whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. So the odds are pretty high. People will experience Christ in us, and they will either welcome or reject. Jesus knows this. And so Jesus sends us not alone, but as colleagues, as companions. You see, our task is not to bring the kingdom of God. Our task is to trust, to have faith that when people experience the nearness of the reign of God, they will become followers. It's not up to the church to tell people what they need to do. We announce the nearness of the reign of God. We point to what God is doing. And we invite people to participate in whatever ways excite them. You see, it's more about community than membership. It's more about connecting with each other rather than doing for others. It's more about the nearness of God's reign than preserving an institution. And in the time that God has given us to serve, it's about risking the institution in order to proclaim the nearness of the reign of God. This week, or the last couple of weeks, I've been dealing with a congregation that has decided to close, a congregation that has chosen to disaffiliate, and a camp that will be gone. And there is one thing I have learned. This I cannot do alone. I need colleagues. We need to do this together. 
And Jesus knows this. So Jesus makes it clear that proclaiming the nearness of the reign of God is never a solo act. We always, always, and as laborers enter into the work of other laborers, whether that be the pairs that Jesus sent out or the laborers who have served in places through years and seasons and lifetimes. And we take their place behind them. You see, Jesus seems to know that the reign of God will come in the small, insignificant, almost unnoticeable conversion of lives and faith communities over decades. And in the small but significant ways, those faith communities and individual lives are leavened in the world. The problem with that is it's slow and it's tedious. We almost might miss it and get tuckered out. And so Jesus gives us to each other. Jesus gives us to each other to remind us that it's Christ's mission, not ours. Jesus gives us to each other so that we can point out for each other when the kingdom of God has come near to us. But mostly, Jesus gives us to each other. So that when our hands tremble, we can reach out. And grasp the hand of a partner as we venture into the world like lambs among wolves. Jesus gives us to each other because that's his best way of going with us himself. Amen. Amen. Amen.